It's great to have you here on Abundance Coaching TV. Welcome to our show. My pleasure. Nice to be with you, Scott. All right. Awesome. Very cool. Now, Tim, just so that the audience just understands, I guess, a little bit about your background, uh, where you came from, and uh, I guess, you know, working with Yahoo and stuff like that, can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and what, you, what you've done in your past? So um, I grew up in eastern New Mexico. I ended up starting my business career in the telephone industry. I was one of the first employees to launch cell phones in the 80s. And uh, I've always been on the cutting edge, Scott. I ended up going to work for uh, Mark Cuban. Most of you know him from Shark Tank, but I worked for him when he was back at AudioNetBroadcast.com. He sold the company to Yahoo. After he sold the company, I moved out to California, became a Yahoo executive, their chief solutions officer. And then I wrote a couple of books. I speak a lot. And these days, I'm living in Los Angeles, and I'm the CEO of a brand new tech startup called NetMinds. Right on. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, I'll tell you the first time that I actually got to know you was at a Bill Hybels Leadership Summit. <laughs> so that was that was a couple of years. That's ago. right, Willow Creek. That was two thousand. I'm going to say two thousand and five was Willow Creek. Yeah, it was two thousand and five. And actually, that's when I first bought your the when I was introduced to you, and I bought your first book, Love Is a Killer App. And I what I found at that time, Tim, was that you were the standout. Um, speaker for me because uh, of your energy and what you were talking about just with passion and how you actually communicated. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. And that actually drew me to like start following you and, and here I am today. I actually wasn't a coach at that time, but growing into this, uh, you were on my top list of people I wanted to interview because of that day and how I got to know you just in, in ways after that. Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to talk to you. I think that a lot of the things you talk about are very similar to the messages I have, not only uh, when I spoke at Willow Creek, but in Love is the Killer app around the simple, simple idea that there is enough to go around. And if we can break through the illusions that stand between us and that realization, we're free. Yeah, that's totally true. So here's, here's a big question. There's a lot of people that watch this show and there's a lot of people that are out there that that are inspired by people who have passion, but they lack passion themselves. So passion is, is a big conversation that I like to have, but what's your take on passion and what would you have to say to somebody who feels that way? So passion is something very deep inside you and it's something that you are fulfilled by. The reason people are so passionate about things, whether they're passionate about their ideas or they're passionate about their kids, is because the thing that drives the passion fills you up on the inside. And people that lack passion aren't filled up on the inside and they can't find anything that will fill them up on the inside. So when a person comes to me and they say, I just feel list more passion for the things that I do. Um, I used to talk about, you know, be creative, find the thing that moves the needle for you, experiment. But you know what I say these days, Scott, when somebody needs life, I say go serve. Yeah. Go volunteer for something hard and give of yourself. Take on a mentee at work and show her how to be successful. Um, roll up your sleeves and help out one of your neighbors in need. If you want to find passion, Go be a generous person and it will reveal itself to you. There's a, there's a story I always like to tell, um, and I, I, I wrote about this in my last book, um, Today We Are Rich, and it was about the essence of finding and meaning in your life. And there's a lot of philosophers out, out there about you know some of the things that Covey used to talk about, um, but Victor Frank book called Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. And what he learned is that when we have purpose, there is no suffering. What he said is that the meaning of life, like, like why you're here, the thing where everything comes from, your passion, your enthusiasm, your heartbeat, the meaning of life is most likely to put in an appearance for you when you're trying to help someone or do something noble. Hmm. So, so, so that's a long answer, but the, 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 short, the short summary here is go serve and you will come back a passionate person because all people I've ever met that were passionate over a period of time about something truly believed whatever they were doing was changing the world in some small way. Right on. 
Very cool. So, but how does that how does that relate? Somebody's out there and they're saying, "Okay, Tim, that's really cool. I kind of get that, but I'm making money at my job. So, how do I do something that I'm passionate about? I hate my job, but I'm making money at it, and I, and all the provisions are taken care of. Like, how do I have passion and really live my passion? Well, I mean, whatever your job is, there's some end customer. And through the transaction of that end customer, even if it's a coworker, say like you're in the HR department or something, there is an opportunity every day in your life to improve someone else's. And you've just got to redirect your focal point and stop calling it work and think about it like I think about work. Work is my opportunity to go play with other adults and change their lives. It's a platform in which I dance and change the world. I've, I've had jobs where I'd say, wow, I, I can't believe they pay me. And I've had jobs where I say, this is the hardest, most, most menial thing I've ever done in my life. But I, I've never been able to distinguish the two as long as I kept my eye on the prize. Like, who am I helping? What am I contributing to? So here's the thing. It's really going to be hard for you to have a 24-7 life filled with passion. Mm -hmm. and to do what you want your whole life and very few people pull it off in this world and I believe that you should this is crazy but you asked me on your show yep. um, I, I believe we should stop telling our kids to follow their passions okay alright go for it tell me why because passions are about what you want right if you follow a purpose and you're a person of service you're gonna follow your compass is gonna follow them not you and you will fall in love with this way of life over the course of time. Now, here's what I say about passions. When we're kids, we should explore them. They give us figure out what we're good at doing, what we can have flow. So we should, and they have an inner society that they should absolutely explore their passions. But as we grow older, we should focus our passions, leverage our passions, but never follow them. Let them guide us. We should follow a purpose, leverage our passion towards that purpose. I, I believe it makes us much more balanced people. Um, and I know that's counterintuitive to a lot of the things we tell people about follow your passion. Um, but you'd be surprised that if you redirect your mind from self to service, how excited and enthusiastic you can get. When you saw passion at Willow Creek when I spoke at that event, yeah. it had nothing to do with the fact that I like speaking. That was a horrible experience for me. Okay. I had to take a, a, a transportation all night in from New Jersey to get there. We had nothing but like mistakes and issues technically when we were trying to get set up. Um, I was nervous. What was it? 5,000 people in the room, oh, 100,000 out on a satellite. I am not um, a communicator or a senior pastor. I was one of the only secular guys on the event. Remember I had sideburns and the long hair. Yeah, and yeah, the when, I, sideburns, when I hit yeah. the stage, the first five rows were folded arms. It was like something out of the Blues Brothers when you go to the wrong gig. But you know what? The passion you saw was a conviction I had that my, the people that work with me on writing that speech, that we'd done what we needed to do to teach people in the audience to beat scarcity thinking in their life. Yeah. And at the end... So, Tim, we were just talking about uh, about life and technical stuff that was going on at the Willow Creek Conference, and then our internet went down. That's all right, man. We, we're, we're fine. I had time to go to my Facebook page and post an idea uh, and, and a compelling picture. As a matter of fact, I'll, I just had to toggle over to it because yeah. you know, I'm just gonna, I'm going to be live in real time with you right here, brother. You, you know, when, when we were at the break, I was thinking a little bit about you know the, the real abundance message that I've been thinking about a lot today. And, and it's a saying I kind of hatched recently, um, and it's based on a great uh, piece of uh, uh, ancient Chinese wisdom from Lao Tzu. He used to say, act without expectation. Um, that's how he would teach people um, the concept of generosity, right? So, so here's my saying for the day. Give, then forget. We, we talk in our culture all this time about forgive and forget. Um, why don't we forget about what we gave to people? Because by expecting nothing, we'll never be disappointed uh, yeah. with the experience of being generous. I, 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 I've been thinking about that a lot today. A lot of people don't have abundance in their life because they don't know how to give. And the reason they give is that they expect too much. And, and that's why they don't know how to give because it's an incredibly disappointing experience over time. And, 
the people that have read Love is the Killer app that have had a hard time living those principles have told me, I just hate to get taken advantage of, and I just feel like their expectations are out of whack. Oh, that's so cool. And it's so true. Like, there's... Uh... It, you've you've heard it many times, and you've talked about it. it there's such a uh, an entitlement attitude out there right now in, in the job force. I'm sure that you saw it a lot at, at Yahoo, and and maybe you're even seeing it today. Just that entitlement attitude. And I have to say, even for myself, I had this conversation just yesterday. Uh, I outsource some of my stuff to people, and I would gladly outsource it to people. I mean, Canada to Canadians, but I outsource it mostly because of attitude. And I find that the attitude and and, act, and the, the work that gets done when I outsource it to India is actually phenomenal. They really appreciate yeah. it. Um, India's been a very successful market for them. Is the killer app. The, the idea of Shanti, peace within you, is um, such a core value in the cultures um, across India. Because, of course, it's a very diversified country of, of, of different cultures. But the abundance idea comes natural. Um, I, I give you an example. So... Um, uh, one spiritual teacher uh, from India explained to me that one of their practices is that when you are down to the last few crumbs of bread, so to speak, what you do in that culture is you gather up the remaining crumbs and whatever clothes and, and, and robes and, and towels you have left and you go out into the street at that moment of desperation and you give the rest of it away to those that are even worse off than you. Then the next day, when you somehow, through creative means, find a meal, get yourself back on your feet, and the world doesn't stop, you realize that you've been under the illusion of scarcity. And um, so I predict that's an interesting spiritual, cultural belief that's probably impacted mm -hmm. some of the attitudes that you've experienced in your work. Oh, so true, so true. That's, that's a phenomenal takeaway. So, like in our business, what, what we've come up with and what we teach is, is basically five five keys to creating an abundance mindset and the first one really is just believing that you're created as more than enough you have more than enough and that more than enough is coming to you in the future and I find that people have the hardest time just like accepting that they were created in a way that they, they were created in the first place is more than enough and their attitude uh, about life just really hit, they have a hard time coming to that place of accepting that I don't know what what are your what are your findings with with that you know people people really don't feel like they're enough. Yeah, um, I I um I, I think that people just need to get in touch with their good loop. Um, they, they've got to find a way to to read the positive feedback that's out there for them. And again, it gets back to this idea of service that you know sometimes if you want to feel like you're enough and that that you have what you need. You've got to put yourself in a situation uh, where the world can tell you, you are enough. Um, you're doing a great job in life. You're making all the difference you can make. And, and if you're not out there giving, you won't receive those signals. So, you know, personal development to me comes down to service. Right on. That's awesome. Very cool. So, tell, tell us more about scarcity. Like, I get into this conversation about scarcity with people, and I get this, like, Oh, that's an interesting concept. Like I talk about it as the, the, the stark opposite of abundance, which I'm sure is what you, you talk about it too. And they're like, oh, that's an interesting concept. And, and they're really like they're at the edge of their seat. They just don't know what it's called. But so, what so is it? Let me, let me tell you what I think it is. Um, I have an analogy I use for scarcity. It's an airborne disease of the mind. Okay? Um, people understand schizophrenia. Yeah. Right? Sure. Um, they understand paranoia. So scarcity is one of those things. It's an airborne disease, Scott, because you catch it from other people by listening to the things they say. Scarcity is a, is a conversation in your head, and the conversation's key dialogue is there's not enough to go around, so let's get ours. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, scarcity can be a way of seeing the world. There's not enough to go around. If Scott wins, I lose. Scarcity is usually a dialogue that starts in your mind, triggered by something in the world. So there's an organizational change at work, and everybody grabs a case of scarcity, worrying that something bad's going to happen to them, so they move the chairs around and try to protect themselves. Maybe you've had something in your life, uh, uh, an economic situation, so you're worried about your bank account balance. That's all you can think about. 
Scarcity is the dialogue that says there's not enough stuff, which is the most scarcity we have. Yep. But sometimes we believe there's not enough power to go around, so we struggle with other people for power. Sometimes we think there's not enough respect to go around, so we try to be that person that's well-respected, even if it hurts other people. But scarcity is this, this life that's driven by a constant state of lack. And you know someone who's come down with scarcity. You talk to them, how are you doing? They say, I don't have enough of this, I lack that. And they define themselves by their obstacles yeah. that they're trying to overcome. Um, the abundance mentality person is exactly the opposite. Think of abundance as a state of complete health. Like happiness, for example. Happiness is the absence of any negative thoughts. That's sure. a good way to think about that. Yeah, it's a great way. So, so, so it's a state of mental health. Um, so abundance is exactly the same thing, too. Abundance is this idea that there's always going to be enough to go around. I may have to be creative. I may have to make a serious change in my life. We may even have an adventure, but there will always be enough to go around. So let's share. The person who has that abundance mentality is the person who is not jealous of other people's success. They don't experience pangs of, of envy when other people get things in life. Um, I find them to be much more powerful, not only in the world of business, but obviously in spiritual teachings as a result. Yeah, right on. That's that's fantastic. Okay, so one of the points that you brought up there is is that people are, of course, influenced by other people. So what are some of the best traits or, or strategies that you've come up with or that you've witnessed that help uh, that you could maybe tell somebody that, that can help, you know, value what you put in your mind? Like, what would you recommend? So, um, when you first wake up in the morning, don't go online and check your email over coffee first thing. Breakfast is not only the most important meal of the day for your body, it is absolutely the most important meal for your mind. For the first 15 minutes, devote yourself to gratitude. And what I mean by this is very specific gratitude. Not like you wake up and go, I'm glad to be alive and the sun is shining. I mean, I wake up every day and the first 15 minutes I review two people from yesterday that made a difference in my life. Right maybe, to the, maybe to the business, maybe to the work I do, maybe just at a personal level. Because you should always be grateful for people and God, not mm -hmm. things and experiences, okay? Because those run out. So then the other few minutes of my 15 minutes is I think about somebody in the coming day who is going to help me. And I think about why she's going to do it. And it sends me a powerful message that I'm not alone, and there's people in my life that either support me as a person or support the mission that I'm on. If that's the first 15 minutes of your day, you fed your mind an incredible breakfast, and it helps focus you for the rest of the day on what you have, not what you lack. Because your email inbox will explain to you that you lack a lot of things, but most importantly, you lack time. Yes. The ultimate scarcity that ruins most people. Yeah, that's so right on. That's so right on. So, personally, why are you the way that you are? Why do you think the way that you think? Like, what would you contribute to? I know that it's a number of factors, but I see you as someone who's elevated himself, but other people must have elevated you, and you must have gone around different circles that have brought you to the places where you're at right now. Well, my grandmother, um, Billy King Kaufman, um, absolutely influenced me to take joy, delight, and apply myself whenever possible to help people. She just taught me how fun it is to be a generous person. She taught me this, this good loop I mentioned earlier that if you go out um, and mentor people every day and then spend every night learning something new just so you can share it the next day, she explained to me, you'll never get dumber by making other people smarter. <laughs> so she, she just taught me a perspective that giving is a privilege. See, she, she taught me the, the root word for giving, it's kind of interesting, it's the Latin word generosis. Yeah. Okay? Um, so so g generosity comes from generosis, which means of noble birth. That's what it means. In the beginning, a generous person was a noble person. And the reason they refer to that is that the nobility, um, many of them had a lot of personal problems. They had to think about war all the time. There's all these issues they dealt with. The only thing they enjoyed was being able to give because they could. They didn't have to. And they, they took delight out of helping other people, and they took delight out of making con 
concessions, even though they were the prince or the king, and that was what was considered being noble. So, so she taught me that pursuit of generosity, and I've just found ways to make it work every single day, even at work. And that's really, you know, for me, what really changed my professional career is that I, I applied my energy differently, and I stopped screening people at work to see if they could help me. I started screening people at work to see if I could help them, and it changed the questions that I asked, it changed the conversations that we had, and as I built a big community and a tribe, if you will, that work around this plan, um, it was much more fulfilling, and I developed an incredible passion for my job, which was going out selling banner advertising. How can you be passionate about that? But I was. Yeah. And I enjoyed those days, and, and I enjoy what I'm doing now. Oh man, that's I can feel it. I can feel the conviction in, in what you say, Tim. That's Thank that's you. phenomenal, buddy. So hey, this is a question, Tim, that that I ask all my guests. And uh, what are you looking for in life? Me? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, there, there's no one thing. So, so the good news is um, I'm always looking for something in the moment that has to do with what I consider a progression of myself as a person. And I just want to achieve all my potential. And I, I want to do enough good things, to paraphrase the Dalai Lama, um, so that at the twilight of my life, I can look back and enjoy it a second time. Um, I was raised to believe that success is not a destination. It is a direction. Yeah. And that direction is forward. So that's what I want to do. I want to keep moving forward. I don't want to get stuck, and I don't, certainly don't want to go backwards in life. Right on, man. That's phenomenal. Phenomenal. So I hear all that, and... All of this conviction, all this passion has said to has said to you, I need to write a sequel to the Love is the Killer app. That book made miles. And you were like, and what was the real motivation behind saying, hey, I gotta write a sequel to this book? So um, uh, I've written three books. I wrote Love is the Killer app, the one you read, and then I wrote a, a book called Likeability Factor, another book called Saving the World at Work about um, the environment and community and those types of things. And um, I was at a point in my writing career where I really only wanted to do one more book, and I wanted to write the book, you know, the book that I was born to write. And my agent at the time um, and I were talking, and what we kind of stumbled upon was that in Love is the Killer App, I never answered a really important question, and it's this. Why was my instinct to give at work? In other words, when I showed up at Broadcast.com and later at Yahoo!, why was my instinct to just start networking everybody and share knowledge without expectations? Why would a person do that? Because that's not what we've been taught to do at work. And I was like, wow, I, I, I didn't address this in Love is a Killer App. It had to do with really three things. Um, my grandmother, Billy, my Christian upbringing, and the seven habits of confidence that she taught me that rescued me from just being a special education kid and helped elevate me to becoming a successful functional member of society and none of that was in love as the killer app and it's an absolutely important thing to understand about me um, and so believe it or not Scott today we are rich is the prequel ah. to love as the killer app it's like a weird Star Wars thing yeah yeah one of the most to me I wrote the sequel first and the sequel sort of like starts in a moment of time doesn't it it's like 1997 I'm dropped into this internet thing and all I want to do is help people in a tank full of sharks um, today we are rich, which is my last book. That's the rest of the story. It tells you a lot more about who I am, and more importantly, the the spiritual DNA of, of which I come from. That's right on. That's so cool. And I respect that about you too, because sometimes to have Christian values and to also, you know, to look at at that as an important thing within business is not the easy way to 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 go. No, and I, I have separated, you know, my conversations about specific spiritual beliefs at work, not because I'm going to hide it, but because work cannot be a hostile environment to people of other spiritual beliefs. And, and, and the reason that people ask me this all the time is like, why aren't you, why aren't you a senior pastor in a church? You know, I, I, I kind of, you could check all the boxes, right? I mean, I, 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 I have that passion, I have that background, I, I like to communicate. And the answer is, is that I have an unacceptable religious belief, I understand, uh, according to a lot of the people in those circles, and it's this. Um, I believe that in most cases, except for the extreme cult, um, I believe that, that, that the Great Spirit reveals himself to humans in, in a way they can understand, telling a story um, that 
that is consistent with their culture. And as Eckhart Tolle would say, I've met them all. I've met the Muslims, I've met the Hindis, I've met the Christians, I've met the, the people of the Jewish faith, I, I've, I've met the tribesmen in the Guinea that had specific pagan beliefs. And I'll tell you something, um, when they practiced those beliefs, they were good people. And, and so, while I am a Christian, um, I respect and admire um, anyone who is a good person based on a spiritual belief that grounds them and gives them an understanding of right and wrong and helps them define their calling. Right on. Right on, man. That's that's cool. And I'm sure that that'll go miles, too, with all the judgments that are going on in the world right now, too. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, don't make the player hate the game. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> there you go, bud. Hey, man, so just one quick little excerpt from the from the book, Today We Are Rich. Uh, the conscious mind is, is the always-on machine that reacts to the stimuli and steers the subconscious mind. You talk a lot about the conscious and the subconscious mind. Oh yeah. So yeah. So what what's the what's the real take on that? So so here's the idea. Uh, I'm putting my battery power, and it's been that kind of day at work. Um, the idea is is that you you are a person that has two minds. You have the conscious mind, and it's always on. And it's always thinking, and it's very shallow. It just kind of thinks about the moment, and it can't remember much. And then you have the subconscious mind. It's like your nervous system. And it feels things. It, oh, I didn't say. Okay. It feels things, and it tells you what you should do. So your subconscious mind is, think of it like your hard drive. And your conscious mind, think of it like your memory, your random access memory. Sure. The conscious mind is always on, and it's built for speed. The subconscious mind remembers everything you've ever done. And it runs your nervous system. Am I mad? Am I happy? Is there scarcity? Is there abundance? Okay? Here's the problem. It's like, if you've ever been in a house where they've got the little dog that's a chihuahua and it tells the big dog, the great dame, what to do, that's typically what happens inside us. Our little ram, our little conscious mind, instructs our subconscious in this chatter that we're not happy. Yeah. It's what makes us feel bad. We feel bad now, so it tells our conscious mind, I feel bad, feel, look, feel your stomach. And that's how people get in a tizzy. So I've learned we have to really control that conscious mind because what we think becomes what we feel. And we make contact with our conscious mind and our subconscious mind every day when you re make eye contact in the mirror brushing your teeth. When you have that passing glance in the rearview mirror on the way to work, how many times have we started the mutters when those connections get made, where we start talking to ourselves about all the things that we're upset about? We start rehearsing all the arguments we're going to have, how we're going to tell this guy. And then the subconscious mind, like some big, you know, galoot, kind of hears all that and goes, oh, okay, when we get there, I'm going to really make us tense up. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? Sure, because yeah. The subconscious mind's not smart. The subconscious mind's primal. Okay, it feels. It does not know anything, but man, it runs the show. It determines your body language, it determines your responses, everything. So the idea then is that you feed that conscious mind good stuff. You take control of your conscious mind with your inner being when you find it strained to negative or impure or fearful thoughts. Worry is just the sustained ex existence of fear. So you should just be aware, like, 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 you should be the watcher. You should learn to get outside of yourself sometimes in those moments of, of craziness. Then look down on yourself. And then look at those thoughts shooting through your head. And, and you'll realize that you can control your conscious thoughts in a positive way by filling them, filling them with gratitude, a sense of opportunity, knowledge that gives you confidence that you're going to do a better job with whatever you are with your mission. Because take advantage of one last idea, Scott. The conscious mind is very small and very limited and gets full really quick. I said it's like random access memory, but I mean circa 1994, like 10 megs of RAM, yeah. not two, three gigs. So it's very easy, researchers say, to fill your conscious mind to capacity where you have room to think about nothing else, okay? Um, I fill it with the right stuff. Yeah. So when I go to work, I don't care about gossip. I don't care about the news unless it impacts my local community. I don't watch the news. The news is ridiculous. I don't read the local newspaper. I have a C 
series of trusted sources of information that tell me what I need to understand financially, socially, and politically, and I shut all of it out and I fill my mind the rest of it that I can with good stuff. So I'll leave you guys with that. I know it sounds crazy complicated, but if you control what you put into your conscious mind, your subconscious mind will feel abundance and your body will feel it physically and your, everything in your life will absolutely change. Man, that's so awesome. Right on. I love how you put that. One of the things that I do with, uh, with my clients, uh, and you I'm sure have talked about this a lot, is core values work. So I help people figure out what their core values are, but one of the big things that I always come up with that really speaks exactly to what you're talking about is that people, when they find out their core values after we do their game, they are in amazement really, first of all, of like, oh, well that makes sense, why I act this way, why I do this, and why I've done that, and I've actually done this all my life, or else sometimes they even realize that I've been walking up other people's ladders, like their parents' values are impressioning on them. So one of the things that we do is we put their values on the wall to help them keep it right there and in your consciousness. That's mind. right. So, so you know, and, and I'll finish with this. Um, when I talk to people about values, the thing I worry about sometimes is whether they're picking values like they answer questions on a survey to, to, to have the right answer. Yeah. So, so sometimes I say, well, what are your values? They kind of think in their mind, well, what should my values be? Well, I believe in fairness. I believe in equality, blah, 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 blah. And I kind of have to stop them because a core value is rather individual. Um, yep. it's, 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 a, it's a quirk. It's a, it's a, it's a very specific thing that, that, that not anybody else I know in my circle. So I, I kind of think about, if you've seen the movie Walk the Line, I know this is actually a true story about Johnny Cash. You know, when somebody tried to figure out what made him take, what did they ask him? They asked him this, what makes you really mad? What do you hate? Remember that scene? I do. And he was like, well, I hate the military. <laughs> <laughs> Remember? And um, they, they, they got from that his energy. So that's what I ask people. I say, what happens in the world that just makes you so upset you want to just punch something? Like, what happens? What is the thing that you... And then you find out what they really care about. One person says, well, I hate liars. Or I hate it when somebody doesn't have, you know, they don't have a chance in their career because of the color of their skin. It makes me really, really angry. So I'd love to dial into that one thing that they think is very peculiar to them uh, that creates a source of just real, mm, I'm upset. I say, okay, one of your core values is inside that. Yeah. Okay? Now let's flip it around. Um, have you ever cried because you saw something and it just inspired you and it, it kind of made you happy and it... And, and, and you just, were, before you knew it, tears were running down your cheeks. And you're not upset. You're actually quite the opposite. You're just incredibly joyful. What are those things? And so then I've asked that to people, and they struggle a little bit with it. And sometimes they'll say things like, well, when s somebody at the Olympics, she wins the gold, and they tell the story, and she's been doing it her whole life for this moment, and her parents sacrificed, and there she is, and I'm so proud for her, and I'm crying. And I go, wow, you want to help people be successful, so you have a core value of stewardship. They don't know that. Really? Yeah. That, that's why I'm crying? Yes. Because other people that don't have the value of stewardship think, oh, good for her. How many medals do we have now? Right? Yeah, sure. So, so asking those extreme questions, what makes you want to punch something, and what makes you cry out of happiness, I think they help people really reveal the core values that, that are real drivers every single day in their life that help them understand what they're doing. Because remember, values, the definition of values, it's the criteria by which we allocate resources and make right or wrong decisions, period. Values are the criteria. Yeah. If you value money over time, you'll work all day and ignore your kids. If you value family above all, you'll leave every day at five to get home and make dinner. That's what I mean when I think of values. Right on, right on. Very cool. Tim, this has been a, ah, this has been. My pleasure, Tim. I want to say how to everybody out there, and thanks a lot for the support on at Sanders Says everywhere, at Sanders Says on Facebook, at Sanders Says on Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. Yeah, and you can find him at, at Sanders Said and TimSanders.com too, right? Yep, yep, that's right, man. All right, cool. It's been a pleasure, Scott. Hey, it's been brilliant. Thanks so much, Tim, for being on our show. It's been awesome having you.